your books. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7, we'll be studying from there this evening. Joshua chapter 7. I'm so glad the Colts game is tonight. For one, because I get to watch it. Usually in the afternoon, you know, I'm I work in the afternoons on Sundays. I get to watch those. But also because I if it was in the afternoon and they lost, I wouldn't want everybody feeling deflated. You guys get that? <laughs> I worked on that one. All right, Joshua chapter 7. The fall of the city of Jericho was a great triumph in the promised land of Canaan. As the people conquered the city, they were to take no treasure. That was one of the rules in Joshua chapter 6, stated by Joshua. You were to take no treasure for yourself. Yet Achan did, we read in Joshua 7 verse 1. And because he did, it brought defeat when Israel tried to conquer the much weaker city of Ai. Thirty-six men from the nation of Israel die on account of Achan's sin. It's interesting that Israel faced Jericho with such courage. And yet, after Achan's sin, they faced a much lesser city with trembling fear. Sometimes in life's great valleys follow the greatest peaks, though. Sometimes in life, it's not the Jerichos that bring us down, it's the AIs. And that was the case with the people of Israel. With Achan's sin, God demanded that the transgressor be punished. And we read of this process in Joshua chapter 7. So I want to read the text with you to remind you of it. Some of you have been studying this in Bible study, but some of you haven't been with us in Bible study. You need to familiarize yourself with this text. And so let's read through the chapter before we make a few points. You read in verse 1, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Joshua chapter 6, we had just read. That there were certain things that were devoted to God. Any of the treasures were to be given to the treasury of the house of God. And it says that some of the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. The men went up, spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said, Don't have all the people go up. Let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Don't make the whole people toil up there, for they're few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes, and he fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all, to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it. They will surround us. They will cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? And then the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. And therefore the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they've become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, 
Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. The tribe the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. The clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. The household the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he's done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning, brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. He brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing fifty shekels, then I coveted them and took them, and see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath, confirming what Achan said. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. They laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned him with fire and stoned him with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. After reading of these disastrous consequences, I want to take a moment with you this evening to consider how Achan killed his family. And here's the first and perhaps the most obvious thing. He killed his family because he didn't heed God's instructions. God's instructions in Joshua 6 are pretty clear. And so we can't blame God for Achan's sin. We can't say, God, you never told Achan. Um, God, it's your fault. Your instructions weren't clear enough. Joshua had warned the people his instructions were very clear. Here they are in verses 7 through 19 of chapter 6. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab shall live, and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers. You... By all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. All the silver and gold, the vessels of bronze and iron, they are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Those instructions are very clear. So why did Achan do what he was clearly told not to do? We don't know really all of the reasons. We know he disobeyed God. But here's a few reasons why some people might not heed God's instructions. Maybe, for example, Achan was absent when Joshua gave out those instructions. I doubt it, since they were given out to the whole company right before the walls fell down. But it's true that some people don't know what God's instructions are because they miss out on edification. That's lessons that build up. They miss out on encouragement. That's lessons that hold us up through trial. And they miss out on exhortation. That's lessons that fire us up to live out our lives when we don't show up. If you're not there to hear the lessons and to hear preaching from God's Word, then maybe you're going to miss out on some of God's instructions. Maybe he was just asleep. Some people show up to services. That's only part of spiritual success. You can come here, and yet you cannot really be here. 
had somebody this morning who was visiting, by the way. But they were here this morning. I was so glad that they were here. But they came out the words and they said, man, that was a great sermon. And what I wanted to say is, you, you heard it because you were sleeping through the entire thing. Uh, I don't know how you knew it was a good sermon or not. But they were here. I'm glad that they were here. Sometimes there's reasons why people sleep. Some of you are on medication. Some of you, you just get worn out. Sometimes I'm just boring. I get it. But some people don't prepare to hear the word. And that's part of the problem. We stay up too late. We're doing too much. We're too busy. By the time we get here, we are not ready to hear the word of God spoken. Sometimes it's a lack of preparation on our part. Some people show up to services, but they spend their time texting, doing online shopping, gaming, napping. It's no surprise they're not nearly as knowledgeable about the scriptures as they ought to be when the lesson isn't being heard the way God wants it to be. God wants us to hear so we can heed. Maybe, though, Achan was just arrogant. He thought that he could arrogantly do what God had said not to do, and he wouldn't get caught or called out on the carpet for it. And that's arrogance. When we think that we can just, with a full head of steam, rebel against God's will and God's instructions, and we're never going to get in trouble for it. Whatever the reason, Achan was wrong. And it led to the death of his whole family. He should have listened. His failure led to the death of his entire family. He didn't heed God's instructions. That's how he killed his family. And when we don't listen as, as parents and as family members to what God's word is speaking and saying to us, then it can harm our entire family and those that we influence. When we're ignorant of God's word. The Old Testament prophet said that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We can destroy our entire families, entire churches by not having a knowledge of God's word like we ought to. But here's the second thing. A second way he killed his family is he thought he could hide from God. He thought he could hide from God. Contrary to specific orders, Achan took what God had forbidden. And I want you to notice the process that takes place here because it's the process of sin. It's the pattern of sin nearly every time it's committed. In Joshua 7 and verse 21, Achan's confession is this. When I saw, he sees something here. What does 1 John say? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Here is his eyes seeing something that he wants, and he is being tempted. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them. The tenth commandment is thou shalt not covet. It strikes directly at the heart. Don't covet things that don't belong to you. And these did not belong to Achan. He sees, he covets. Well, he didn't have to act on that though. You might have a desire for something. That's when we know temptation is taking place, when we have a desire for something, but we've got to deny ourselves. And Achan didn't deny himself. He sees, he covets, and he takes. But then what does he do? A lot of times we stop there. There they are hidden in the earth. He hides it. And that's the pattern in the process of sin from the very first time a sin was committed. That was the pattern of sin. Adam and Eve commit a sin. What do they do after they sin? Well, they try to hide from the presence of God. What do we do many times when we sin? We try to hide it from people. Achan took what God had forbidden. And interestingly... He takes something that he can't even show off to anybody else in Israel. What fun is there in that? Now think about it. He takes a Babylonian garment, a cloak from Shinar. What's he going to do with it? He can't wear it around the people of Israel. They're going to know where he got it from. They're going to know that he stole it from Jericho. And so he hides it in the earth under his tent. Well, what good is it doing there? It's like buying yourself the best outfit you've ever found and you keep it in your closet your whole life. What good is it doing there? They would have all known he sinned. And his money wasn't any good in Israel either, so he hides it in the ground in the middle of his tent. Was it really worth it? That's the question. Was it really worth it? Maybe there was some kind of personal satisfaction. Maybe in the middle of the night when other people from Israel weren't around, he could pull it out, look at it, and stare at it, enjoy, admire in the, the artistic uh, work of the beautiful Babylonian garment. But to whom was he going to boast about it? When we possess forbidden things, 
when we engage in forbidden activities, what good is it to us? What good is a treasure that you have to keep hidden so nobody will find out about your sin? For a lot of people, that's the way their sin is. They gotta hide it. We need to be painfully aware of the fact that if you've gotta hide something, there's a very good chance you ought not to be doing it in the first place. If you don't want somebody reading your text messages, reading your emails, if you're blocking off certain people from questionable posts on various social media sites, if you've got secret passwords to your computer because you're hiding certain files or sites or your computer internet history on there, then you're nothing really but a modern Aiken. We look at Aiken and we think, well, how could he do that? How dumb of him? There's a lot of people like Aiken today doing the exact same thing that Aiken was doing just in a modern 21st century culture. If you think you can get away with a sin because the spouse or the kids or the church or your parents don't find out, you need to realize something that God already knows. And you haven't gotten away with it. Aiken didn't get away with it. Take the blinders off. God knows our every action. He knows our every thought. So, question for you is what secret sins do you need to get right in your life? Achan thought he could hide from God. That's just not true. You're not going to do it. In Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 and 13, take a look at what verse 12 says. The word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You think you got away with something because uh, your spouse isn't going to hold you accountable because they don't know about it. Your parents aren't going to hold you accountable. They don't know about it. No, God is the one who ultimately is going to hold you accountable. And God knows. So don't think that you're hiding it. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Paul writes to Galatia as he's just gone over the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 7, Don't be deceived, God is not mocked. You're not fooling God. Achan wasn't fooling God here. God knew about him. He says, Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. You're committing any one of those sins in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Adultery, committing sexual morality, you're being lewd with another person, you're committing idolatry, you're a sorcerer which has a connection to drugs, you're hateful, you're a contentious person, jealous of other people, you go off in outbursts of wrath, you're envious of others, you're, you're practicing heresy which is essentially turning aside and following false doctrine, you're a drunk, you're a party goer, God knows about all that. God's not mocked. Don't think because you can hide it from your church family. Nobody knows. God knows, and that's really ultimately what matters. God's not mocked. You sow to your flesh. That's the flesh. The works of the flesh. That list right there. You sow to that, you're going to reap corruption. You're going to get what you're sowing. God is not mocked. Achan thought he could hide from God. We're not going to hide from God. That's how he killed his family. His entire family is destroyed because they think they can hide from God. Here's a third thing, though, a third thing about Achan that led ultimately to his family's death, and that is he forgot that God provides. Think about Achan for a moment, what Achan had seen in his years wandering with Israel in the wilderness and then as they crossed the Jordan River. Achan had seen Israel fed by manna for 40 years in Joshua chapter 5. Okay, For 40 years, that's when it ends in Joshua 5. It had just ended days before this particular sin. Achan had witnessed that. God had provided for them for 40 years. Every day he wakes up, there's manna on the ground, except for the Sabbath day, of course. He had witnessed the fall of two kings of the Amorites, Sihon and Og. You know, Israel probably was scared to have tried to have defeated those kings, but with God they were able to conquer them, and they were able to enter on that east side of the Jordan River. Achan had witnessed the drying up of the Jordan River. We just read about it in chapter 4. 
verses 21 through 24, read about the Jordan River being stopped up and then uh, standing up. The water stood up as a heap so that people could cross over the Jordan and enter into the promised land where they were about to defeat Jericho. And then next, next stop was Ai. He had witnessed the fall of the mighty walls of Jericho. I mean, imagine that. God had just, just, literally seconds, minutes before Achan steals that stuff, miraculously knocked down the walls of Jericho. Achan had seen that. All along, Achan had seen that God had provided. And yet he still wasn't content with what God was providing. Maybe greed was just a, a little sin to Achan. And sometimes that's what gets us in trouble. We think we're ignoring and we're avoiding the big sins, the things in our mind that are really bad. But this was just as bad. Not, we think because we're not committing murder, we're not, we're not adulterers, we're not those people, then, then our sins aren't nearly as big a deal. But this isn't what the scriptures teach about greed especially in Achan's case, for him to keep that money for himself, he was robbing the very pockets of God. Because what was this money to be used for? This money was to be taken, and it was to be put in the treasuries of the household of God. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 19 makes it pretty clear what they were to do with the money. It says in verse 19, All the silver and the gold, the vessels of bronze and iron, they're consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of of the Lord. When Achan decided to keep that for himself, he was robbing God. This was to go to God's treasury. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, I want you to take a look at what that Old Testament prof prophet Malachi has to say about our giving to God. He says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, will a man rob God? During this time, a lot of the priests were having to go back to working second and secular jobs. Why? Because there wasn't enough money to support the priesthood anymore. Why? Because people weren't giving like they were supposed to be giving. It says, well, a man robbed God, yet you have robbed me. He says, you say, in what way have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You're not giving to God what God deserves. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Notice he says, there will be food in my house if you will just give. What's that mean? You're taking food off the tables of the priests when you don't give properly. There are preachers, not just here, this local place, but there are preachers all throughout the country, all throughout the world, who are trying to preach the gospel, and many of them are not getting the support they need to do that work. Why sometimes are they not getting the support they need? Well, sometimes it's because there are members of the church who aren't giving like they should, and they are robbing God, and they are not allowing food to be put on the tables of these preachers because we're not giving. Somebody mentioned at our, our last business meeting that we'd like to give more to foreign evangelism, and we would, but our debts have outweighed our contributions for nearly the past year and a half. And some people might think we're spending too much, but maybe the real problem, and consider it this way, is that we're not giving enough. I must confess, I'm going to tell you something, there have been times that I have not even preached about giving, not even talked about giving, not even addressed it, because people sometimes have the impression when the preacher preaches about giving, he's hoping he'll get a pay raise. You think, think, they think you're preaching on out of personal ambition or personal interest. People might get offended. People might rebel. They might have a sour attitude that the preacher is talking about money again. But I've got to tell you, I'm sorry for having not preached on it when I should have because that's being a coward. It's being a coward to preach on what needs to be preached on just because somebody might not like it. I refuse to preach on it sometimes and that's probably the wrong thing to do. If it's a subject in God's word, it needs to be preached. If Achan could rob God, if Israel could rob God, 
If the church at Corinth could be guilty of robbing God, then Christians today can be guilty of robbing God too. Chrysler's just reached a deal that will grant bonuses and pay raises to many of its members. Does your giving go up as your pay goes up? Young Christians, some of you are now working jobs and getting paid. Are you giving some of your earnings back to God or are you depending on your parents to do your giving for you? Some wives have jobs and yet the income that gets given back to the work of the Lord is all from the husband's pay, not the wives. Are you robbing God? Not giving as you should. Sometimes we get a tax check. We earn interest on our investments that we never contributed upon before. Do you give a portion of that back to God? Others receive inheritances after loved ones die. Money from the sale of land and houses. Is any of that going back to God? Or have we already earmarked 100% of that money to our earthly pleasures? God's taken care of you thus far as you've given back to Him. He will continue to take care of you. But you need to make sure that you're taking care of His people, that we're not being greedy with our earnings. And if we do so, we commit the sin of Achan. We forget God will provide us with our needs, and we ought not to be greedy for more. To be covetous is to be idolatrous. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, calls covetousness idolatry. And here in America, where we are blessed far beyond what we even realize, when you compare our situation to the situations of so many other countries, here in America, perhaps one of our greatest temptations is materialism and covetousness. We think we need, need, need more. And it's not that we need more, it's that we want more. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Some people are very proud of themselves because they're sexually moral and they're pure and that's good and that's wonderful, but what about covetousness? Is that a problem for you? Because of these things, covetousness is just as much one of those big sins as anything else listed there. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Yeah, greed needs to be preached on. It's not a little sin. It's just as much a sin as anything else listed there. And that sin led to the destruction of Achan's family because he was greedy. Because he wasn't giving to God what God deserved, and what not necessarily he deserved, but what he claimed for his own. He kept it for himself. Another thing, another reason why Achan and his family died is because he made his family accomplices to his sin. And that's pretty easy to see, I think. When you read the text about Achan, you read that his sons, his wife, his daughters, all of them die. All of them are burned with fire and stoned with stones. And sometimes we read this text and we think, well, why? Why did they have to get punished? Achan seems to be the one that stole it. Take a look at it. It says, Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the silver, the cloak, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, all that he had. They brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. One of the simple lessons that we need to learn about our individual sin is that it has an effect upon other people. The sins of an individual affect entire families. The sins of entire families affect the church. The sins of a church affect entire communities and your influence in the community. The sins of a community affect our entire nation. This was clearly the case with Achan's sin. If just one sin went unaddressed, unacknowledged, and unpunished, then it would send a message to Israel that sin is to be taken lightly and sin, in turn, would spread like wildfire throughout Israel. So God tells you before you conquer anything else, before you go and do anything else, before you expect to have success, then you fix the sin that's in your midst. And that's a great principle for marriages, families, churches, communities. We need to fix our problems individually and with one another before we can go and try to help other people with theirs. Jesus put it this way, when you point the finger at somebody else, realize that you've got four fingers pointing back at you. You need to fix your own personal sin before you can go and try to correct others. And maybe this is where America's gone wrong. 
We've been slaughtering babies for years, and a lot of Christians just stay quiet about it. We've seen our government legalize same-sex marriage, and many Christians won't say a peep for fear that it would hurt somebody's feelings. We may see other sins on a regular basis, people filthy talking, trashy dressing, foolish acting, and we don't want to speak up because we don't want somebody upset with us. Have you ever thought, just for a minute, that maybe that's how Aiken's family felt? They knew Dad shouldn't have picked up that stuff from Jericho. They knew it was wrong deep down in their heart. It kind of bothered them a little bit. They knew he had it in his tent. I mean, it's a tent. You don't know somebody's dug a hole underneath the tent and stuffed a bunch of stuff in it? Of course they knew about it. And that's why they're held accountable. They knew about it, and they did nothing about it. Maybe they didn't want to say anything and cause an argument in that little tent of theirs. They just kept quiet to keep the peace when keeping quiet was the worst thing they could have possibly done. And God held them accountable for it. He'll hold us accountable for keeping quiet in our classrooms when we know we should be speaking up. He's going to hold us accountable for keeping quiet in our office cubicles and on those assembly lines when there are times we should be speaking up. He'll hold us accountable in our church buildings when there are sins that need to be addressed and we should be speaking up. He's going to hold us accountable in our families too. The worst thing you can do to someone who is headed in the wrong direction is to fail to say anything when you could have done something about it. And for that reason, the whole family is considered accursed and they face the judgment of God. Romans 1 puts it this way. As you read verses 28 through 32, it talks about this great list of sins. And then when you get to verse 32, it says there that knowing the righteous judgment of God, those who practice such things are deserving of death. It doesn't stop there, though. Not just those who practice those things, but who approve of those who practice them. You go along with it. You're going to be held accountable, too, Paul writes to the church at Rome. The church at Rome, by the way, was an incredibly diverse church living in an incredibly diverse culture, a culture that was filled with Jews and Gentiles, with devoted God-fearing people, but with pagans, idolaters, sexually immoral people. And yet, Paul's telling them, you need to speak up when you see these sins. Ephesians 6 tells us that families should be led in a new direction. Fathers should be instilling the lessons of God with their children. Parents should be teaching their children so their children can obey parents and the Lord. The opposite of ache and sin is the way of salvation for us. But the last thing that got Aiken's family killed is he confessed his wrong, but he did it too late. He did it too late. He waited too long. Why did Aiken? Uh, you read this and you got to you got to wonder, why did Achan make Israel go through all of the process of finding the perpetrator when he knew all along who it was? I mean, was it a lack of faith? Maybe he just thought, well, God, God doesn't know. Joshua doesn't know. He's just kind of playing you know, good cop, bad cop with us. He doesn't really know what's going on. Maybe it's a lack of faith. Maybe he was still self-deceived into thinking that he had hidden it well enough to never get caught. Oh, I did this in the dark. Only my family knows about it. They would never rat me out. There's no snitches in my family. But clearly, whatever the reasons, he only confesses after he's face-to-face -face with Joshua and he's the last man standing. And by that time, the covenant had already been made. The verdict had already been declared. He waited to confess, even though he knew all along what he did was wrong. His confession was forced, and it wasn't made out of remorse. True godly sorrow, true godly sorrow works repentance. When you're just sorry you got caught, that's, that's not really true repentance. Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It says in verse 9, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, you know, Achan kind of says, no, oh, I'm sorry, I sinned. Why didn't he say that before they went through all the rigmarole of lining up the tribes and the families and the clans? 
and then man by man trying to single out Achan. I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. You were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Which little boy do you appreciate more? Think about this. You're a parent. Which one do you appreciate more? The little boy who comes up to his mom and says to his mom, you know, Mom, I did a bad thing today. I stole something out of your purse and I knew you'd be mad, so I'm sorry and I want to give it back to you. Or the boy whose mom sees that something's missing from her purse. She takes her kid, she lines them all up one by one, checks their pockets until she gets to the last one standing who stole it. And finally he confesses, well, I don't know how that got there. Which kid do you think has made the better confession? I'd say the second kid needs his rear end busted. The first one needs a hug. The second one ignored his conscience while the whole process was going on. The first one listened to it and responded to it. Acts 2.38 shows God allowing men to be forgiven. It tells them to repent, to be baptized. And 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 mentions that God is long-suffering so God is giving you a chance. God does give us the opportunity to be forgiven and to turn, to change, to change our mind. But one of the things we also read in 2 Peter 3 is that one day, God's long suffering is going to run out. Your time is going to run out. There's not going to be any more time left for you. You're not guaranteed a tomorrow. You're not even guaranteed a, a tonight. Time will run out at some point for you to make those changes that you need to make, to make those confessions you need to make to fix your life. God's being long-suffering with you. So don't be like Achan and keep ignoring the warnings of God and putting off immediate obedience. The opposite of Achan is immediate obedience. If you know what to do, the right thing to do, then do it. That's how Achan killed his family. This horrible story can have a good ending if it's a story that helps you. And that's why it's here in Scripture to help us. You have an advantage that Achan didn't have. You have time to obey the Savior who died for your forgiveness. Perhaps you're ready to leave the family of Achan and to be added to the family of God. There's no good reason for you to be lost tonight. Quit putting off what you know to be right and obey the Lord's will today. The place where Achan was stoned, do you remember what it was called? It was called the Valley of Achor as a reminder of the disaster that came to Israel because of his sin. Achor is a word that means trouble or troubling. Many years later, it's given a new meaning. In the book of Hosea, you're reading chapter 12, 2 and verse 15, God says the valley of Achor, which means trouble or disaster, it would become a door of hope. Perhaps that's a reference back to what we see happening there at Achor. Achan had troubled the camp, and yet, as soon as Achor's sin was taken care of, then they were able to go and conquer Ai. There was good news that followed the bad news. Where once there was defeat, though, God gives victory. Where once there was disaster, God gives new hope. In the same book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 1, he writes, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but He will heal us. He has injured us, but He will bind up our wounds. God is sovereign and His desire for His people is not defeat. His desire for you is victory. And this story shows us how one man's sin brought a nation to defeat, but it also shows us how through humble repentance and dependence upon the Lord, the defeat was turned into victory. God tells Joshua in chapter 8 and verse 1 to go and to defeat Ai. And this time when they go there, they are not defeated, they are victors. If you'll trust in God, if you'll turn from your sins, if you'll obey Him, you also can be a victor. Your past sins can be forgiven, but don't think you're going to face the judgment day and God's not going to know uh, what you've done. If you haven't had those washed away by the blood of Jesus, then you aren't right with God yet. You need to get right. 
and get right tonight. So if your subject, if this lesson has touched you anyway, I encourage you to make changes in your life, whether it be publicly or privately, but to do those things that will make you pleasing to God, knowing your sin will find you out. If you're subject to invitation, why don't you come while we stand and while we sing.